close to you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning. Uh, we are the Wirets, Ryan and Emily, and if we haven't had a chance to meet, it's really good to meet you all. Uh, we are going to be reading today from Romans 6, 15 through 7, 6. What then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? By no means. Do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, so now present yourselves to members as slaves to righteousness, leading to sanctification. For when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you were now ashamed? For the end of those things is death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Or do you not know, brothers, for I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. For a married woman is bound by law to her husband while he lives, but if her husband dies, she is released from the law of marriage. Accordingly, she will be called an adulteress if she lives with another man while her husband is alive, but as if her husband dies, she is free from that law, and if she marries another man, she is not an adulteress. Likewise, my brothers, you also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to one another, or to another, to him who has been raised from the dead, in order that we may bear fruit for God. For while we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. Thanks, Brian and Emily. <clears throat> well, good morning, church. Good to have you here today. If we haven't met yet, my name's Nate. Get to serve on the team here and love what we're up to. Man, I'm pumped to jump into our 11th part of this series through the book of Romans. We're hanging out here all the way through mid-October, 24 parts to this series. And our hope is to, as a church, have really firm foundation for our faith, that we understand what it means to be a believer. And Romans just really helps give us some grounding, some firm foundation. That's why we called it the foundation of faith, just some firm grounding of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. You see, this morning's message is titled, New Allegiance. New Allegiance. And man, I, am, I, I, I love this portion of scripture, excited that we get to run through it together. Now, as I was working my way through this text, it took me back to February 28th, 1998, you know, way back, right? Like almost 26 and a half years ago. 
And it was, a, it was in western Washington, so you can imagine on a February 28th, it was raining, and it was. It was kind of a gloomy day in western Washington in a sleepy little town called Belfair, Washington, at this cute little church called Belfair Assembly of God. And it was on that day at about 1 o'clock in the afternoon that my beautiful bride Heidi and I stood up before our family and friends and declared our love for one another. Like it was on that day we declared our love and we entered into this thing called marriage, this covenant marriage with one another, saying I do, like pledging ourselves forever to be with one another till death do us part. Heidi's grandpa, he was officiating our wedding ceremony, which was awesome. I mean, premarital was a little bit awkward, I'm not going to lie to you. Like in premarital counseling, you got to talk about some things to talk to Gramps about. It's just weird. But it was fine. We made it through that. And he officiated the ceremony. And, man, it was a fun day of celebration. And after we had said our vows to one another and after we had exchanged rings with one another, he said what had been said millions of times before on platforms just like that. He said, by the power invested in me, as a minister of the gospel and by the state of Washington, I now pronounce you husband and wife. And then he said what I was waiting for him to say the whole time. You may kiss your bride. How cool is that? Like my first responsibility as husband was to kiss my bride. Thankfully, I was pretty good at it by that point. So I wasn't messing that one up. So the one responsibility I had at that moment was the one responsibility that I was actually good at. I had that part down. It was everything that came after that about being a husband that I have been working on for the last 26 years. I was husband, and I was also becoming husband. Another moment, May 11th, 2002, was on a Saturday. It was Super special day. It was the day that our oldest daughter, Abigail Nicole, was born into this world. It was the day before Mother's Day. Can you believe that? Like, that's great timing, by the way. The day before Mother's Day, Abigail shows up into the world. Up into the world. And I know that some of you guys out there, like, your, uh, your take on the delivery room is like hands off. Like I want, like I, we were paying somebody a lot of money to do this thing, right? Like I don't want to be any part of it. You know, let me know when it's all done. Baby's clean and then I'll hold baby. But I, that was not me. I was like, I'm all in on this. I was hat on backwards, literally. I had my hat on backwards and I was ready to go. And I remember the midwife saying, so dad, do you want to catch the baby? And the catching the baby was fine. I'd caught a lot of things in my life. Like, no, no big deal. What threw me off was that word dad. It's like I'd never been called that before. Like, this is a brand new experience for me. Like, all of a sudden, in a moment, I become dad. And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, I want to catch. I'm not trusting you. You might have butterfingers, man. I got this, okay? And then baby... Abigail's born, and she asked, do you want to cut the umbilical cord? I was like, I absolutely want to cut the umbilical cord. Now, that's, that was tougher than I thought it was going to be. I'm not going to lie. I had cut a lot of things in my life at that point, but that was interesting. But again, catching and cutting. I was very proficient at both of those things. As a dad, my first responsibility was to do a couple of things that I was very, very capable of. Now it's been 22 years of working on all of the other stuff that comes along with being dad. So in both cases, my identity changed in a moment. In a simple moment, I went from being single guy or fiancé to husband. In a single moment, I went from no kids to being Dad, Like, my identity changed in a moment. And because my identity changed in that moment, my responsibilities changed as well. And how I responded 
to the changing of my responsibilities would communicate my dedication to my new role, right? We all see this. We see this in society. We see people who are called husband but do not act like husband. We see people who technically are biological fathers but do not show up and become fathers or become dads. And the way that we respond to our new identity communicates to the world around us our dedication to our new identity. And the same goes with the text that we read this morning, we being Ryan and Emily, they read it this morning. And the same goes with this text. It tells us that there was an old life in which we used to live. For those of us who were followers of Jesus, Paul is writing specifically to the church here. That there was an old way that you used to live. Now, if you're here and you've not surrendered your life to Jesus, then you are a part of that category. Like, you are just living the way that naturally you live, but it is apart from Jesus. And I want you to say, I just want to say to you right out of the gate that this text, although written specifically to believers, is an invitation for you to enter into relationship with Jesus so that you can put off the former life and you can take on the life that God designed you to live. So it's an invitation. If you've never heard about the gospel or, or wrestled with what it means to surrender to Jesus, I'd love to have a conversation with you later today about that. Just come meet me in the lobby and we can talk about it. Or if you're online, just shoot a direct message and we will fo- we'll follow up with you about that. So this text is for believers. It's helping us to understand that there was a lifestyle in which we used to live. But because we have now a new identity in Jesus, there is a new way that we live because of that identity. There are new responsibilities that come along with that. And Paul is just being really clear here. And last week's message, the summary statement of it was this, death to sin gives us freedom to live. Death to sin gives us freedom to live, to live into this new life that Jesus has bought for us. Today's summary statement flows right out of that, that our obedience declares our allegiance. Again, summary statement for this text today is obedience declares allegiance, or our obedience declares our allegiance. See, you can have a title, The question is, are you actually living out that title? There are many who declare themselves to be Christian, but yet live like there is no God at all. So our our obedience, are we actually following? Another way to say it is this, who we obey declares or communicates who we are following. So to say I'm a follower of Jesus, but yet we do not follow him in action, speech, thought, means we're likely not actually following after Jesus. We just have a title before our name. And Paul, he wants to dive into this for us so that we can best understand it. Now, again, like it, it's happened uh, throughout Romans, this is a habit of Paul's. You can see it in his writing style through Romans, is that He's, he begins this section with a question. And the question is a question that flows out of a statement he previously made. The statement that he made was in the text that we read last week, but I want to just back it up a little bit so that we can understand how this all flows together. Sometimes when you read the Bible sporadically or just little chunks at a time, it's hard to string together the logic of the, uh, the, the flow of thought, if you will. So it's important to back it back up. Like you read a question and go, oh, why, did, why was that question raised? Back up a little bit in the text, read it through again, and then place the question inside the context of what the writer was trying to communicate to you. So we find the question flows out of the statement that Paul made in chapter 6, verse 14. And this was the statement. He said, sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under the law but under grace. Sin will have no dominion. It will have no power. It will not control you. It does not dominate you any longer. 
Because you are not under the law, but you are under grace. And the question that comes out of that is, in verse 15, it says, what then? Are we to sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? Like if sin doesn't have any control of us, if it has no power, if it's not our master, if, if, if it really is, is rendered powerless, then we can just continue to go on doing that, right? Because it doesn't control us any longer. It seems like a logical thought, right? Especially if you're trying to find a loophole in the process in the system. I love loopholes. I try to find them. I know it's naughty, but I do, okay? We as people, we like loopholes. It's like, well, if sin is not in power and control anymore, then, then I can just keep living the way I want to live, can't I? And Paul answers that question very firmly and very quickly. It's in verse 15 as well. He says, by no means. By no means. We cannot continue to live the way we used to live. We put that life off. By no means should we, as followers of Jesus, keep living in the sinful lives we've been living in. He has given us a new identity. Our obedience declares our allegiance. How we obey Christ declares who we are actually following. And then he goes on to say, do you not know? It's a question, but it's really a statement. It could also be says, you know this. Like, this isn't new news to you. Like, you already know this reality. And then Paul goes on to state the obvious, but the obviously overlooked in our culture. Like, he says, you know this already, but let me spell it out for you once again, just in case you forgot along the way. You have a master, and your master isn't you. Crazy, right? Like, we do get this. We totally understand this. But I know we're led to believe in our culture, in our society, that we are in control of our own lives. But we know this is not true because most of us in this room, we have transitioned from adolescence and into adulthood. In adolescence, you thought that once you became adult, you got to be free. And then you get to adulthood and you're like, man, there's still a lot of people who are calling the shots for me, right? I always think it's funny when somebody wants to become self-employed and their desire to become self-employed is so that they can be in charge. That, that they can be free. I was like, you do know you're going to either have a customer base or a customer base. <laughs> like, there's somebody else calling the shots for you. You don't know it, right? Like, so we know this intuitively, but, but our culture is constantly screaming at us that we get to be in control of our own lives. And they say it in statements like this. I'm sure you're going to be familiar with them, that we are the architects of our own destiny. I always wanted to be an architect, so that sounds cool. We're in the, we are the architects of our own destiny. Or we hold the keys to our own future. How about this? This is our life, our rules. Sounds enticing, doesn't it? My life, my rules. This one I love because of the contradiction. It's like a logical contradiction, but people say it with such like authority. We get to design our own fate. Wait a minute, what? Are we designing it or is it fate? Which is it? You can't have both of them at the same time. But these are kind of like the mantras that we hear in our culture and our society. And Paul explicitly tells us that we are slaves to whatever or whomever we obey that we are obeying somebody or something, and whatever it is that we're obeying, that is what we are slaves to. This is what he says. He says, do you not know? If you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves to the one you obey. So if you obey something, you are a slave to that something, right? It's really clear what Paul is trying to say. So for those of us who are followers of Jesus, we have been, what the Bible calls, we have been saved, 
Being saved or set free does not mean that we are free from having a master. Everybody, every human being has a master. We all have a master. In fact, all of humanity has one of two options when it comes to who's in control of your life. We talked about this last week. We used Martin Lloyd-Jones, old pastor, theologian, and author. We used his illustration of two fields, that you can think of all of humanity as if they are in two fields. One field is dominated by sin and Satan. He is the ruler over that field. He is in control And he is manipulating you through sinful actions and activities, which Paul says leads to death. Or you're a part of the field that God is in control of, which leads us to freedom. Because God, as the creator, knows how he created us to live. And when we're living into the way he created us, that's where we find the most freedom. You have one of two options. Everybody who has surrendered their life to Jesus gets transported from this field ruled by Satan. You know, remember the claw? I talked about the claw and the the grocery store claw. Mm, Stuffed animal, pick it up, mm, drop. Now, you and I are horrible at that, and that game's rigged in order for us to lose our money, and they keep their, you know, 25-cent stuffed animal. But this, this... This reality with God is, man, when we surrender our life to God, he comes over with that claw, picks us up, transfers us into the field that he is in control of. You got two options. There isn't a third field. There's not a field where you just are kind of in limbo land and trying to discover and, yeah, I haven't chosen one or the other. You either choose Jesus or you are an enemy of his. That's what the scriptures tell us. I know that that's not like really popular, but that's just what the scriptures tell us. You're either surrendered to Jesus in God's field or you're not and you're in Satan's field and under his control. Those are our two options. So you can be a slave of sin or you can be a servant of God. That's it. Slave of sin, servant of God. And I love how one commentator said it. He said, You can't be neither, and you can't be both. Meaning you have one of two options. You can't be neither. There's not a third option on the table. And you can't be both. You can't have one foot in one field and one foot in the other field. You have to choose who is going to be in control of your life. So Paul says, says, you are either slaves, or you are slaves, rather, to the one you obey. Either, that's an important word, either sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. These are your two options. It is binary. It is dichotomous. You cannot have both at the same time. Now, slavery to sin It begins at birth. It is a very natural progression. I know that we like to give Adam, like not our Adam, not Pastor Adam, but like Adam, the first guy in the Bible, like book of Genesis chapter one, right? We like to give him a hard time because we say, man, that Adam, if he hadn't a sin, we wouldn't be in the predicament that we're in. And and I like to just remind myself whenever I go through that thought process is even if everybody before me was sinless, I likely was gonna screw it up. Because sin is just a natural thing, right? We're born into it. Sinful people is just natural, right? We are just born into sin. So a slave to sin, it's natural. It's normal. Servant of God, that comes when we are reborn. When we put our hope and our trust in Jesus, that's where we become a servant of God. Or another way to say it that the Bible talks about is when we are born again. This rebirth that happens, and we find newness of life in Jesus. We've talked a lot about that over the course of this series. And our obedience declares our allegiance. Really, what we do with our life, Paul is trying to say, what you do with your life declares which field you are in. 
And he also is trying to help us recognize that both of these roads are leading somewhere. Whether you're a slave to sin or a slave of righteousness or, or a servant of God, both of these roads are leading you somewhere. Neither of them are stagnant. They are not stationary. They are not static. They are advancing all of the time. Both of these roads are leading you somewhere. My youth pastor growing up, he said a lot of crazy things. A lot of things that I couldn't even share here with you. But one thing that he shared as we grew up is something he loved to say all the time in youth ministry that I latched on to. He said, if you're not growing daily, you're dying gradually. If you're not growing daily, you're dying gradually. And what he was trying to communicate in that one little sentence is there are two roads that you can be on and they are both advancing. You're never standing still. You're either growing or you're dying. And clearly, because Paul penned these words for us, he penned them for his first audience a couple thousand years ago. God preserved them through time so that you and I could read them because clearly spiritual growth is a desire for, that God has for you and I. He desires for us to be growing up and maturing spiritually in our lives. And as we follow God's truth, as we read it, as we learn from it, and as we obey it, our habits and our wills are shaped into his likeness. So as we follow God's truth, our wills and our actions, our thoughts, our speech, all the way down to our motivations, they are being shaped and formed into the likeness of God, our creator. How incredible is that? It's like you go all the way back to Genesis where it says, let us create man in our own image. That's God talking, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Let's create man in our own image and in our own likeness. And then we blew that up. But when we surrender our life to Jesus, God goes back to work on creating us in his own image and in his own likeness. Friends, that is the road of sanctification. It's the road of sanctification. We introduced this word last week. We coupled it with two other words that I just think are very helpful for us to understand when we process these kinds of things. One is justification. We've talked a ton about that in the last 11 weeks. It means in the moment when you say yes to Jesus, you stand righteously before God. Stand righteously before God. And then one day, either Jesus comes back to get his church, take us to be with him, or we pass from this life into eternity at death. At that point, we will experience what's called glorification. There's no more sickness, no more sin, like evil and sin are eradicated. They're not a part of the picture. We don't wrestle with them anymore. We don't struggle. They are just simply not a part of the picture. And we all are excited for that day where there's no more sickness, no more sadness, no more disease, no more sorrow, no more pain. Like, we all look forward to that day, but we are, like, we're not at that day yet. We're in this different season, and it's a season of sanctification where God is shaping us and molding us into his likeness. We're being transformed back into the image of God. And when the topic of sanctification comes up, it almost always comes up with an age-old question. What's our role? And what's God's role? What's our role in our sanctification and what's God's role in our sanctification? Is our role passive or is it active? Like, what role do we play along the way? I think it is a great question for us to wrestle with. And this morning, I want to give us four truths about sanctification that my hope is it will give you some handles and help you understand what your role is and what God's role is in your sanctification. And the first truth is this. Sanctification is a work of God. 
Sanctification is a work of God. Again, if we're going to lay a foundation and we're going to talk about sanctification, we have to understand that God initiates our sanctification. Like that is a fundamental principle. God is not up there just waiting for you to respond to him. He has been in pursuit of you. God initiates. He always initiates. Nobody comes to the Father unless he draws you to him. That as you read through Old Testament, New Testament, you see one common theme, and that is God in pursuit of people. So sanctification is a work of God. And that's why Paul says in here, there was a life that you used to live, but thanks be to God. We read it this morning. Thanks be to God. See, Paul recognized that our sanctification is built upon, first and foremost, the working of God. It is him who is working in us. In fact, in Philippians, another book that Paul wrote in the New Testament, he says, now in my absence, or rather like you did in my presence, but now, more, now much more in my absence, continue to work out your own salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you to will and to act according to his good purpose. That's Philippians 2.12. See, Paul recognizes that you and I do not get shaped and formed into God's likeness without God first initiating the process. It is God who works in us to will and to act, to will. If you have a desire to do what your creator wants you to do, that is because God is drawing you in that direction. When you have the power to do it, that is because the spirit of God is empowering you to live the life that God designed you to live. First and foremost, sanctification is a work of God. It's a work of God. Which leads us to our second point, is that sanctification is, it's not automatic. I was going to say it's a process, and you can write down either one. Sanctification is not automatic. Wouldn't that be awesome? Like, it would have been so cool at 12 years old when I accepted Jesus that all of a sudden I was transformed perfectly into his likeness. That would have, like, it would have alleviated so much heartache I would have got a lot less whoopings as a teenager. Like, it would have been so nice to be automatically transformed into God's likeness, but sanctification is not automatic. You know what is automatic? Aging. It's true. Day by day, minute by minute, second by second, you and I, we are aging. There's no way to reverse that trend. That's just a thing, okay? So we are automatically aging. You know what's not automatic? Maturing. So you're going to get older. Doesn't mean you're going to get more mature. And as I say that statement, you had somebody's face pop into your mind, didn't you? You thought perfect. You thought of somebody. Maybe it was your neighbor. Maybe it was your in-law. Like, I don't know who it was for you. I had a face pop up into my mind, too. These people that definitely got older, you could see it, gravity was taking over, but maturation had stopped a long time ago. So we're all going to age, but we're not all necessarily going to mature. And spiritual formation is the same in our lives. Just because we get older, just because we've been in church for, I don't know, years and decades does not mean we are being shaped and formed into the likeness of Christ. Doesn't mean we're actually following him because obedience is what actually declares our allegiance. Spiritual formation takes time. It's a process. And when I say process, I don't want you to think about minutes, hours, and days I don't even want you to think about days and weeks. Spiritual formation, I want you to think about months and years and decades. It's a lifetime of Christ shaping us and molding us into his likeness. 
So it's a process. And I hope for some of you this morning, recognizing that this is a process kind of brings some freedom to you because you're like, man, I should be further down the road than I am right now. That might be true. Maybe you pushed pause. Maybe your spiritual formation just stagnated along the way. But you know what? You can pick up the process today by being obedient to what Jesus is calling you to. It's a process. We are all in process. It's going to take months, years, and decades. Now, inside those months, years, and decades, the amount of time we spend with Jesus, the amount of time we spend in environments that are, like, ripe, that are inducive to the Holy Spirit transforming us, like, that matters, too. That matters, too. Which leads to the third point, or the third truth about sanctification is sanctification is fueled by our obedience. Sanctification is fueled by our obedience. And I want to read Romans 6, 17 through 23 once again. With this, with that truth in your minds, let's go back to the text once again. Again, sanctification is fueled by our obedience. This is what it says, but thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed. And having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. Like you couldn't do this on your own. Thanks be to God, he set you free from sin. So now you can live as slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because your natural limitations for just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to lawlessness leading to more lawlessness. So now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. Paul's saying in your former life, you gave yourself away to something in that something What did it do? It was impurity. And what did it do? It led to lawlessness, which led to more lawlessness. That's what he's saying to you. He's like, you were on a spiral, a downward spiral. And your lawlessness led to more lawlessness, and it was the actions that you were doing. So then he goes on to contrast it, and he says, So now present your members as slaves to righteousness leading to sanctification. You used to present your members to impurity and lawlessness. So now, just in the way you did that to lawlessness, now do that unto righteousness. And when you do that to righteousness, when you obey what God commands in his word, that leads to sanctification. That leads to Christ's likeness. And then he expands on it a little more. He says, for when you were slaves of sin, you were free in regards to righteousness. You just simply didn't care. You didn't know you should care. You cast all care aside because you were not a slave to righteousness. But what fruit were you getting at that time from the things of which you were now ashamed? Like, you know that that produced nothing in your life. Why would you continue down that path any longer? But now, or excuse me, for in the end, those things, for the end of those things, rather, is death, right? It's leading somewhere. But now, we love those two words, don't we? We talked about them a lot quite a few weeks ago. But now there's something that has changed. There's a new identity. There's something different to live into. But now you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. The fruit you get leads to sanctification and its end, eternal life. Both roads are leading you somewhere. And he summarizes it all with one of very famous Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Like the payment for that lifestyle is death. But the gift of God, this is not something we earn. These are not wages. This is not something owed to us or due us. The gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ our Lord. Sanctification is fueled by our obedience. See, we have the ability to decelerate or accelerate sanctification in our life. 
And we either decelerate it or accelerate it by ignoring or obeying the truths found in God's word. You take your foot off the accelerator and things slow down. You put your foot on the accelerator and things speed up. Another way to get our minds around this is by practicing spiritual disciplines, we fuel our sanctification. Spiritual disciplines are something that the church has has celebrated and has uh, engaged in for the course of, 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 of the church's history. And these spiritual disciplines are like studying God's word, opening it, reading it, Letting it read you, doing this on a, if not daily, a regular basis. You spend time in God's word. You cannot know what God commands of you, what God wants from you, unless you are reading God's word. You just can't. So when you spend daily or regular time in God's word, you are fueling your sanctification process because you know what God wants from you. You know what God wants for you. Another spiritual discipline is prayer and worship, communing with God, worshiping him as creator. And whenever you worship him as creator, it always puts you in your place as created. Spending time with your creator in prayer and in communication. One of the songs that we sang this morning was talking just about that, how Jesus is our high priest, and that the the veil that used to separate God's presence from common people was torn when Jesus was was, uh, died on the cross, which now gives us access to God. We can go boldly into the throne room of God, is what Hebrews tells us. So we should be doing that. And when we do that on a regular basis, spending time in prayer with God, we are fueling a sanctification in our lives. Another way we fuel it is by gathering together regularly as a church. Getting together and worshiping, getting together and having fellowship with one another, having conversation with each other. These gatherings are a place that are right for the Holy Spirit to do something in our lives. And I love that we have an online presence. I'm grateful that we use it as a supplement as a church. But I just got to share real fast, like, if you're just listening online all the time and you're never never gathering together with the body of Christ, you are misusing what that tool is there for. Like, there's nothing that replaces gathering together as the church. Using the gifts God has given us to build the church, nothing replaces this. And there's a common mindset today that, you know, like a, a, a regular attender now shows up like once or twice a month. I'm just saying like that's decelerating your sanctification process. You're not using your gifts the way God designed them to. You're not being like uplifted by other people's gifts. Like I just encourage you like if you want to help fuel, you want to help fuel the sanctification is that you make Spaces like this, a priority. It doesn't have to be this place, but bodies like this. You make it a priority to show up and to use your gifts. And that's another way that fuels our sanctification is serving the world around us. Our church, our community, that we give ourselves away in service to others. It's amazing how God shapes us into his likeness when we are giving ourselves away in service to others. It's incredible. You get around some really annoying people when you're serving. <laughs> Nothing you can do about that. Just kind of, just, it just helps sand those rough edges off. And what I found in my life, maybe you found it in your life to be true as well. Generally, when I'm annoyed by somebody else, it's my own life that needs to be shaped and molded, not theirs. This is more about who I am than it does about them. But it's in the context like this that that can happen. Like spiritual dif- disciplines are an important part, serving the community, reading, obeying scripture, prayer, worship, like all of those help fuel our sanctification. And I'm going to take this one step further. If you are uninterested in obeying God, if you are uninterested in obeying God, you've likely not experienced true salvation. Like you might declare, I'm a Christian, You might say I'm a follower, but if you're not actually following, 
it begs the question, like, who are you following? And if I have zero desire to obey, that doesn't mean I'm doing it perfectly. But my desire is to follow my creator. My desire is to follow Jesus. And when I do it imperfectly and the Holy Spirit of God points it out, then I do what's called repent. God, I'm sorry. I turn from that activity or that attitude or that speech and I walk towards Jesus. If I have no desire to turn and walk away from that thing, chances are I haven't experienced true salvation. It's time for me to have a conversation with Jesus where I surrender my life completely to him. Which leads us to our final point, the final truth. Sanctification is becoming who we already are, but have not yet become. Sanctification is becoming who we already are, but have not yet become. The way that we communicate this as a church is through our mission statement, people becoming the church. You see, in a moment when I'm justified, I stand righteous before God, and then I live a lifetime as he shapes me into his likeness. I am becoming what I already am. It's paradoxical. It's paradox. Like, for the rest of my life, I'm becoming who I already am. And this is described in a couple of uh, grammatical moods that you find in this text. One is indicative and one is imperative. Just simply means indicative statements are like they describe what is reality. So in here, Paul has given us the indicative. The reality is anyone who is in Christ, they are righteous. And the imperative always flows out of the indicative. The imperative is the command based on the reality that you find in the indicative. And the imperative, then live righteously. Then obey what God has commanded. Then actually follow him and what he says. For example, some of you might be thinking right now, this room is hot. And if you could, you would give somebody a command, turn up the AC. How many are wishing that that was a, yeah, see? Indicative. Hot room, that's a reality. Imperative, turn up the AC. Indicative, we are righteous in Christ, justified before him. Imperative, now go live like that is true. Declare your allegiance through the obedience that you have in your life. You see, perfection is always the goal. And sometimes we dumb that down. Sometimes we, we, we dilute that. Perfection is always the goal. There is no sin that God's like, no, that's cool, it's fine. I mean, after all, you're only human. Like, those are the things that we say, those are not the things that God says. Perfection is always the goal. Jesus was perfect. He is our benchmark. He is the one we follow. That is always the goal, but progress is the pathway. None of us in this room have it figured out. Level playing field. We are all still in process. So perfection is the goal, but progress is the pathway. And my hope is that this text encourages us and challenges us to follow the pathway that leads to eternal life. If we could have the worship team come at this time as we wrap it up. I apologize. I've gone a little bit long this morning. And as they come, I want to tie back to my opening illustration. This moment where I became a husband, this moment where I became a father, and there was so much for me to learn about both of those things. I was so ill-equipped to become a husband, and I was even less equipped to become a dad. I remember when the nurse handed me Abigail in her car seat, and we were supposed to strap her into our car and take her home. I thought to myself, you have no idea. I am not equipped for this. I don't have the skills. I don't have the tools. I don't have what's necessary. And it's true. As a husband, as a father, I did not have what was necessary. And since that moment of declaration, you are a husband, you are a dad, I have been working to become both of those things. And the same is true in my relationship with God. At 12 years old, he declared me his child. And now for 34 years, I've been living into that title. 
child of God. Now here's what's incredible. I hope this ties it up for you. My pursuit of Jesus has helped me to become the husband and the dad that I am today. Apart from a relationship with him, my relationship with my wife, my relationship with my kids, they would not be what they are today. I'm not saying they're perfect, but I'm telling you they're pretty awesome. I love it. And it's not because of who I am, it's because of who Jesus has shaped me into. I had no tools, I did not have the resources, I did not know what it looked like, but I kept following Jesus. And when you follow Jesus, the priorities in your life, he prioritizes them such a way that all of a sudden you become the best husband, you become the best father, you become the best wife, you become the best employee, you become the best neighbor, the best friend. It's amazing what Jesus does when we follow his leading. So this is my hope, is that every one of us in here today, we will evaluate our lives and ask the question, who are we actually following? Would you stand to your feet this morning? The takeaway that I want to point to this morning is this. Take time this week to ask yourself, who am I obeying? And where is it leading me? Who am I obeying? Where is it leading me? And as the band plays, I'm going to pray, and then the band's going to play. And I hope you begin to process that right now. And if you need prayer about whatever you're wrestling with, we have some friends that are going to be up here in the front. They would love to pray with you. Again, if you're here, you haven't surrendered to Christ, I'd love to have a conversation with you about what that looks like. So Jesus, we've opened your word. It's super challenging. Thank you that you don't just give us commands and then leave us to it, but yet you walk with us along. You like, you like walk alongside of us to live it out. So I pray that for each one of us, that we would surrender and that we would obey the truth found in your word. In your name we pray.